Okay. So, geographic predictions. So, this is the a couple of examples of regularization multiplier. So, if I don't convince anybody of anything else, answer me this. Does regularization, does changing regularization drastically like this, does it affect the output of the model in geography? Yes. Mm. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, and in this paper, we didn't examine the response curves, and we're doing that kind of thing in a follow up. Um, but I would, what would you guys predict about uh, a response curve to an individual variable here compared to one down there? Smooth and slow. Which one's smooth? The, the, the below. Okay. All right. Um, and so then, based on the quantitative evaluation statistics, um, we identified the regularization multiplier that seems to, to be most reasonable. Um, primarily based on uh, lowering overfitting to reasonable levels. And then we also examined the models uh, in geography um, based on what we know about the species, what zones it inhabits, the distribution of various um, vegetation zones, and that also concurred. The, the overall, the best level for this species was um, regularization about two. Okay? Okay, but that actually depends on the species. Absolutely. Well, how did you decide? Because I've been playing with it, and to me, it always just, I have an example here, but the paper I was working on, I used this, I kind of, the higher regularization, the better the model just continues like that, until you, you know, uh, so I, I did like 20 different settings of the regularization, and just, the, the iconic just drops. Uh -huh. Right. But how do I, and then I said, uh, uh, yeah. it was useless for me, really, it just ended up, Saying put regularization then the species lives everywhere. Yeah. That's, so know. I think okay. So this is one approach to assessing our estimating optimal model complexity, and it's by using spatially evaluations of spatially independent withheld data. Another very different approach is with AIC, which Warren proposed, mm -hmm. and there you, in general terms, you are it's telling you what the best balance of complexity and prediction is. So it's saying, is your increased prediction ability worth the increased level of complexity, right? And so now our lab is doing some studies to try to compare the two approaches and see if they agree or not. Uh, so this is based on the AIC uh, you now. No, not, you're talking about AIC, right? Uh, okay. Yeah, and you can see in the AUC, so you're based on your AUC value. This one we're based on these three graphs that I showed yeah. you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So AUC, yeah. Yeah. AUC diff, yeah. and omission rates. Yeah, exactly. Okay. But why two and not four? I'm sorry? Why the two and not four for the regularization? Oh, yeah, um, I can't remember. <coughs> I mean, we did, I mean, we wanted to see when it really started to level off and get very close to um, to our expectations. So that's here. Uh, for AUC diff, I mean, we would hope it would be zero, but you always have noise in your sample, right? And so this this level of overfitting, we, we attribute that to uh, overfitting to noise, which um, we can't really get rid of, right? Um, but this is the, yeah, so you say why two and why not four? Um, yeah, I mean, basically, we were trying to establish principles in this paper, and I think that we probably say something about the range of optimal must be somewhere in this range. Yeah. Right. But I, so I don't think we there's no we didn't see an increase in performance. You know, eight compared to four, right? And when we looked at the models, they got really blurry over here. So you're able to keep more discrimination over on this side, and you see that. I would try. Here, yeah. and you do see, when you see, some improvement there. So this was, anyway, this is, this is the first time we've tried this, and um, I think, we think this is the, somewhere in here is probably the optimal zone, right? But it's not at 8, and it's not at 0.5, and it's not at 1. The results of this study, are you sure they are not species specific? Okay, so, we certainly can't demonstrate that they're anything other than species specific. 
Um, however, I can say we have done similar tests for several other species, mm -hmm. and we're consistent. From this area or from other parts? Of the um, here and in Madagascar. Right. Is it always around two? It is always substantially higher than um, than default. So, uh, you know, two, three, but the other thing is these other experiments we've done have varied um, feature classes also. And so this was with large sample size. We have a sister project that a different student did with small sample sizes where she did a jackknife of occurrence records. And this is an, actually this K-fold um, validation here is a jackknife of bins, an N minus one jackknife of bins. So it, 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 um, very similar in intent. And that study's out as well. And um, so she found, for example, with these species uh, in Ecuador, that hinge features and um, regularization 2.0 were the best in her study, but she didn't go any farther than two. Um, so in that case, it was very interesting that it said, you allow accent flexibility for the shape of the response, because hinge can fit any shape for a response, but you um, apply high protection against uh, complexity. So that was an interesting finding from that paper. Well, oh, sorry. But that same value is, is applied to all the variables in the same way? I'm sorry? The, the localization yes, yes. is applied to all the variables? Correct. Yeah, the same way? Yes. So the same value is multiplied by, so all the variables are multiplied by? Um, the but it's the penalty. The default penalty, there's a different level of penalty for each feature class. So for linear and quadratic and hinge and threshold. And those are different. Those were tuned empirically by Philip Tendudic. Uh, I can tell you how they did that tuning. Um, and this multiplier um, is a coefficient that's multiplied by each of those individual values, right? And then that, um, that will be applied equally to all variables. And so we set up the paper, uh, if you want to read it, with some reasons why we think that unfortunately the Phillips and Dudek tuning experiments were set up in a way that would lead to default values of regularization that should lead to overly complex models. And the primary one is they had a lot of records and they used random splits. And there was no filtering done. So okay. this is published. Yep, well, I yeah, believe you published. Yeah, it's in your Dropbox. <laughs> <laughs> you should test it. But I, uh, you get one of these Pearson ones where they use some of these. Ah, he said two is good. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. One last question. Yes. The regulation of the fire, it uh, reduces the impact of each variable. The regularization in general? Yeah, in general. So it applies a penalty for including an additional variable, right? Um, or an additional feature, because remember, um, so um, a linear feature for one variable is one thing, and you can include a quadratic feature for yeah, that variable. Penalty for those. Yeah, every time you include another feature for any yeah, variable, penalty. right? And it includes a stronger penalty if the weight for that feature is higher. For example, it's like you divide it by one, divide it by two, by three. Oh, yeah. the whole coefficients, like if you have, if you have this regularization <coughs> and you have the coefficient, it's not like it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't actually divide the it coefficient. It, it's just telling the model when to stop. The it tells the algorithm when to stop. So the algorithm, I mean, it's not, this is an analogy, right? Okay. Because this is not really how the optimization algorithm works. But it's something like it's, it's going to include it has to decide which features to include and not include and what weights to give to them, right? It's a machine learning technique that's trying lots of things and sees what is best explaining the fits to the data that it has, right? But those different features have different explanatory ability, right? And if, imagine you get, um, we even forget the weights and we just say how many variables uh, we want to include. And if you say you have 19 variables, I'm going to charge you one euro per variable, right? And you want to produce a good model, but you don't want to give me 19 euros back, right? Um, so if you can use five variables um, to do a pretty good job explaining um, 
then, and you only have to pay me five euros, and if you could do you know, a little bit better job with eight variables, is it worth three extra euros? <coughs> so that's what regularization is all about. So in the end, it makes you to forward to try to work with a simple model. Yes, so it, it ends up, uh, we've always found it ends up as a simpler model. And when you look, um, when you look actually at the Lambda file, you'll see with a default regularization, you may have, you know, 20 or 40 or 60 terms, whereas with regularization 2 or 4, you may have 8. Okay? And you look at those response curves, and instead of being jagged like that, you know, they're like this. Okay? And so there's some other papers. I mean, there's the Warren Seifert approach of uh, AIC. There's... Yeah, you have personal experience with using this. Uh, just a little bit, yes. Uh, a couple students working on that. Let me give the pan out. <laughs> so, um, we have that approach. There's a very nice paper um, by, I think, Ella Kearney and Phillips about the art of modeling range shifting species, where they talk about smoothing. Um, I'll put that one. Great. What are the, there's a few that we cite at the beginning of this where people have addressed model complexity. Um, and then there's other things that I've seen you know, at, at meetings or that we have presented in meetings or that the students are working on. And what we're seeing consistently, that yes, indeed, higher regularization multipliers are these simpler models in environmental space and uh, response curves that looks uh, more reasonable and um, predictions that are more more diffuse, right? And the question is all how when to like when to stop, right? Like it seems that we need higher uh, protection against uh, complexity, uh, and this is one approach of how you can try to identify that based on performance and with uh, with health data, especially spatially with health data, right? And another completely different approach is when you use all of your records and you use AIC, so specifically the size sample size corrected AIC little c. But one of the, so there's two things about that that I can say, and this is not um, my expertise, but one is that using AIC in a machine learning context is a little unorthodox, and that's in the Warren Seifert paper, and um, Dan has said that it's been pointed out to him, and he says correctly that um, one of this, one of the reasons is that it um, you can't establish the exact correct sample size for something that's needed in that test. And the next step is we need to somebody needs to figure out an approach to uh, approximately, um, well, to approximate the correct. Uh, unbiased estimate of a sample size uh, parameter that's needed for that. So that's one kind of issue. The other is an assumption of AIC. Anybody know in this context what that assumption is that should be mentioned in the Warren and Seifert paper? So it's using all of our occurrence records, right? Whereas here we have withheld data. But it's assuming that those occurrence records are an unbiased sample from the entity we're trying to model. All right? And so if we don't have any, if we have museum data uh, and we don't do any spatial thinning or filtering, do you think that's reasonable? Probably, I don't think so, right? And so one experiment that um, one of my students is doing now is what model does he get out as optimal by AIC if he uses unfiltered records? And how does that compare to what he finds when he gets filtered records? So that, that will say, OK, how realistic is that assumption if you don't filter in this data set, right? I've tried it with background settings as well, like taking 20 different backgrounds, see how to change the idea. It's, it's just, you can spend weeks playing with it. It doesn't make much sense. That's what life is. So, so yeah, so we are just in the past nine months or so started playing with AIC to compare with this. Okay? But, uh, no, yes. Uh, sorry, but if you if you don't need to, or don't want to transfer your results to okay. the right. is it bad to have some other treatment? 
You just want to characterize this Um Yeah, I, I think it's still bad because you you still should have an underestimate of the areas that are suitable in your study region, and it should still, if you have um, if you have bias sampling, like clumps of sampling, it should still have too much prediction strength around those um, clusters, right? Yeah, so mostly what he said, scenario that he said, mostly he's predicting the distribution that he saw. Yeah, the sample that he saw. Yeah, the sample that he saw. Right. Um, so the difference between transfer and not transfer, the main point is if we have instances where we would have to transfer into non-analog conditions, then we would need to design a test that forces uh, the model to transfer into non-analog conditions and see how it does under those circumstances. And how does it work with the uh, categorical variables? Um, well, is it different than this particular example is all continuous, but there is a, a regularization parameter beta j for categorical variables. And it was doing in the same code as in Dudek. Um, and so the regularization multiplier is applied to that just as it's applied to everything else. So there shouldn't be any reason that I see that it should work any differently. OK. Um, so that's the end of this uh, presentation. And the, the two things that we've tried to show here are spatially independent evaluation uh, with, um, with the background uh, corresponding to the, the training point is a way, um, we think about a way to assess performance. And then the second thing is um, model complexity really uh, varies in maxent, like a few studies have shown. And this could be a way to identify um, optimal levels of complexity. Those are the two points we want to show here.